I trust that you've been encouraged already. We were able to sing together. Uh, God is at work. Amen. And so thankful for the truths that we were able to reflect on. Um, and so join me in Romans chapter 8. Again, this is on repeat. Romans chapter 8. Oh, if the whole world knew Romans chapter 8. And while you're turning there, let me remind you of Romans 11. These words should be behind me on the screen. Paul concludes this great section by saying, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who have given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So we jump jump into the deep. Romans chapter 8 has been hopefully uh, an encouragement to you up to this point. And a lot of things that we could have said that Paul points our attention to. But we come to two verses today. Two verses that uh, connect actually to last week's sermon. But could be, um, there could be multiple sermons given on these two verses. And so I want us to look at verses 29 and 30. And then carefully wade through some of the most complex and even elevated thoughts about our God in all of the Bible. And so Paul writes this in verse 29 of chapter 8. He said, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is God's word. And so when you think about Paul's theology and logic, and one of the things that we talked again about last week is that you cannot dislodge one or two or even three verses from its greater context, because that can get us in trouble, right? And so we have to remember that the great sort of umbrella over chapter 8, specifically when you get to the middle of Paul's writing and his letter in chapter 8, is that he's talking about suffering. And last week we we tried to unpack and make the point that God is even sovereign in our suffering, right? And that nothing comes from the hand of God or through the hand of God that isn't for his glory and for our good. As a matter of fact, verse 29, we talked about how in 29 there is a link of which Paul is arguing that, that everything is working together for our good, right? And so this link is that this is working together for our good. And what is the ultimate good that Paul has in mind? Let me draw your attention in way of reminder to what he says. He says, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. We talked about the preeminence of, of Christ. But then earlier, right before that, he says, to be conformed to the image of his son. That God has in mind our holiness, our growth, our spiritual maturity. And so all of these things come to the conclusion that God is sovereign in our suffering for his glory and for our ultimate good. So the main point, or one of the points last week was God is sovereign in our suffering. But now in 29, the connection to verse 30, we have to also understand that Paul is saying that God is sovereign in our salvation. Now, before we get into the nuances in the letter, the the words and some of the disagreements, let me just ask if we're all agreed to this point. Thank God that because of his grace, we are Christians. All right, we've found common ground. Amen. That's the end of the sermon. Or no, just kidding. (laughs) No. And so, but we have to see this. We have to see not only is God sovereign in our suffering, where do we lay our head at night? Where do we rest? God's in control, but we have to drill down a little bit deeper, right? We have to go where Paul goes, and Paul says that he's, he foreknows us in 28. He's also predestined us, but then in verse 30, it's what's called the golden chain of salvation. There's an order to this. And look at what he says again. And those whom he predestined, he also called... And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And so there's this link, this golden chain that Paul lays before his readers to help take us into the mind and work of God. What is God doing in this great work of redemption and salvation? And it is right to say that God is sovereign in our salvation. This is the ground in which we stand, both in suffering and in thinking about what God has done to secure us. And one of the things that I want you to see or want to help you see is that in this text and even all the way through the next few chapters, 
Paul is beginning to help us understand when you trace your salvation, where do you go? What do you attribute your story of now being a Christian to? What is the the ground floor, if you will? And one of the things that we see is that our salvation is attributed, hear me, to his divine initiative. His divine initiative. So the motive of this saving act, though, alone, I would argue, is to his grace and his love. Here we get a glimpse into the mind and work of God in saving his people and securing us to the end. So you may think of it this way, because this whole chapter, when we first looked at chapter 8, sort of big contextual thing here. Remember, Paul starts with, there's no condemnation. Remember that? The very opening. Look at it. He says, therefore, in verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? So no condemnation. We don't, in Christ, all the fury and wrath of God has been poured out on the Son of God so that the people of God go free. That's really good news. So there is no condemnation. Praise God. We don't have to operate or live in fear. God has freed us because he's punished his son in our place. So there's no condemnation. But then he moves into, remember, no alienation. Remember that theology of adoption? That we go from the courtroom to the family room. That in Christ, I am welcomed into the, into the, to the family of God. There is no alienation. I'm no longer on the outside looking in. Like, I am comfortable and at home with God's people. How is that? Is it because something I did? No, because God in his grace has made me safe and secure in the family room. And it's a beautiful place. So there's no alienation. And then he ends, verses 31 through the end of 8, there's no, what? Separation, right? That there is no separation because of the work of God's grace in my life. So he goes from no condemnation, no alienation, to no separation. Well, what is the basis of that? I would argue that right here in this section, this grand glorious section of the mind of God at work in redeeming and saving people is that God does this. And what God does, he does perfectly. You can rest your head on this fact is that when God saves, he saves completely and he saves perfectly. That's what Paul is trying to, in this sort of order, this, this order, this spiritual order of what God is doing He's trying to not create division in the church. Oh, I'm going to probably preach a lot today, all right? (sighs) This is hard for us because we don't suffer that much. Most Westerners like to argue they're either Westlands or they're Whitfield, right? This is church history, right? And I, I've told someone before, I actually think that this, this sort of disagreements and nuance in the church is actually God's sovereignty in helping all of us. But I'm, I'm, I'm off on a rabbit trail already. So my point is, I, I think we struggle with God's sovereignty because we actually don't suffer that much. When you go to people who are actually enduring suffering, the weird debates that we get into because we're so academic and we like, it, it actually isn't there that much. Let me just remind you, the reason that Paul is elevating the work of God is because he knows that real suffering is a reality for God's people. And he needs us to know that there is somewhere we can stand on that we don't have to waver. That when sea billows crash on us, sorrows of sea, like like the sea billows keep coming, right? Where do you rest? So how do we go from no condemnation to no alienation, no separation? How do we endure intense suffering? I would suggest to you that we must agree with Paul. We must stand unwaveringly on the sovereignty of God and our salvation. That these realities, these words that we read, like everybody wants to do a word study, which is good, but they're linked. These things are are on the basis of his initiative, his choice, his call, his declaration, his preservation of our souls. This section, again, is not supposed to be divisive in the church, but formative. This section is not meant to create doubt or distress, but confidence and gratitude. Amen? So when you think about the grace of God taught through all of the Bible, specifically Romans 9 through 11, it is to inspire worship and pure amazement of grace. And here we see, 
in this, in the very language itself, if we're going to be careful, good Bible students, is that God is the subject and the verbs, the actions are attributed to the subject of the sentence. This is pretty simple English. So we need to think about the pronouns, we need to think about the verbs, and we need to be amazed that God does this. One of the ways you should, th- you should think about your salvation, your story, is that God is the active causation and we are the passive recipients. We are the recipients of grace and mercy. And so when I say, when I say that God is sovereign in salvation, what I'm trying to articulate is this. God works the miracle of salvation. We are the recipients of amazing grace. He lavishes it on us. God is sovereign in this. The intention, purpose, and prior act of God are primary in this passage. So throughout the Bible, though, just before we deal with the text, Christians are described with terms such as chosen, elect, loved, beloved, and even sheep. I was rereading John 10 this morning. And all of these terms are purposeful. And they should inform your view of salvation. These terms are not just arbitrary. They're not just thrown out there. They are defined and explained, and it will serve us well to think what the text actually means. Both what's explicit and implicit by these concepts will go a long way in helping us think about what God's sovereignty is in salvation. So let me walk through this golden chain in in a short time and try to help you think about what this chain, the links are. He uses the term foreknowledge actually twice. In verse 29, "For for those whom he foreknew right? He also predestined. I find it interesting that in verse 29, the order repeats itself in verse 30. It's almost as if foreknowledge and predestination are linked almost as a measure of Paul lifting this out of the text and saying, okay, these two things are linked inseparably, but let me amplify this because it's actually repeated, right? So notice in verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. We've already got the purpose, but then we come to verse 30, And those whom he predestined, he also called, right? He also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So when you think about foreknowledge, this word, a good simple definition is to know beforehand. To know beforehand. Now, let me just ask a question that most of us should agree on if you're a Christian. Do you believe that God is all-knowing? Okay, this is a foundational elementary principle of being a Christian, that God is omniscient. God knows it all. Here's the fact. God does not learn anything. God doesn't learn anything. There is nothing that he learns. He knows all things exhaustively. And what Paul, again, is doing in this idea of foreknowledge tied to predestination is he's trying to help us understand, and this is the hard part, right? This is the finite trying to get into the infinite, But it's purposeful. Like, we shouldn't be afraid of that. Like, we shouldn't be embarrassed about this conversation. But the point is, is that God is trying to pull back the the sort of the power and the beauty of the attributes of God and saying, no, God is omniscient. He is is all-knowing. He does not learn. He is not like us. He knows all the possibilities, but he also knows what will happen. There's nothing that he learns. He knows everything exhaustively. Paul's pushing us. In this idea, in this concept of salvation, even into the mind of God, and this is important, that the order of how things work in salvation is attributed to the, in some ways, to the, to the all-knowing part and attribute of who God is. He knows all things and all possibilities. He actually does know who will choose him. But here's the thing. Here's, the, here's where some of the differences begin to unfold. The use of divine foreknowledge is sometimes used to propose that God's saving act is him looking down the halls of, etern- of history, right? That he's looking down the halls of history who will first choose him and then he responds to that self-determination, right? That's, that's one view, that God is looking down the halls of history and he's going to graciously then set his affections on the one who will choose him positively. And we know this as the difference between the Arminian and the sort of the Calvinist debate, right? You hear those terms, everybody gets, ooh. <laughs> right? Yeah, we do. And so, long sermon, but I hope it will be helpful to you. And so some would propose that God's foreknowledge lends itself here. I would 
well, let me just work through this. Millard Erickson, in a massive volume, writing on the classic Arminian position of what's called men or women's free choice of being the primary deciding factor, right? That it turns on first your choice. Erickson writes this in actually counter to the Arminian position. He says, quote, it is humans who render their actions certain. God simply acquiesces. He said that again. So he's writing from the different perspective and saying that he says it's humans who render their actions certain. God simply acquiesces to you. Nowhere, I would suggest, does God's electing love turn on man's self-determination or prior choice of him. The Bible always attributes salvation to God's prior choice of us and that our choosing is based upon God's sovereign grace and divine love. Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. So there's differences here, admittedly. Uh, again, problematically is that these, div- these differences have sadly caused division rather than healthy discussion. I would say, I, just, I, I say I land where Paul does, Ephesians 1 and 2. What, what is the motive by which God does this? Nowhere can you clearly gain textual support that God is responding first to my choice. What you can see repeatedly, and I would suggest go home and read Romans, or excuse me, Ephesians 1 and 2, is that what is the ground floor of this? God takes his initiative based upon his divine love and his divine grace over and over and over again. So a good question to ask yourself is how far back do you trace your conversion? How far back do you trace it? Do you trace it to your choice of him first or his choice of you? Now, again, admittedly, we a lot to wade through here. Romans chapter 9 is going to be a fuller elaboration on the subject of election and God's grace. We have to deal with it. It's there, and we shouldn't be embarrassed about it. But even the word foreknowledge in Romans 8 verses 28, or excuse me, 29 and 30, this word could be rendered for loved. And this is important, especially when you consider the Old Testament background of this word in which the Septuagint uses. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew in regards to the Old Testament. But one of the things that you find over and over, not just one text proofing thing, but over and over and over in multiple places, you find the background is that that word actually goes beyond simple awareness to what's going on. That word actually captures the idea of intimacy and action. On the, base, on the part of Yahweh. It's linked to him setting his covenant love on his people. On him knowing, when the, the term knowing is used in this setting and in multiple places in the Old Testament, it is God's knowing, it's his foreloving, it's his affections towards his people. Amos chapter 3 verse 2 is a literal use of this. Just give you some references. Exodus chapter 33 verse 17 and even in Genesis 18, 19. It's, it's God going beyond just his omniscience to his actually his active love towards people. This is why this chain of predestination and calling actually should inform our view of foreknowledge. You can't separate this chain. And I would suggest that foreknowledge is more than awareness on God's part of what might happen. It is actually linked to what actually he decrees to happen especially in his saving purposes. So Millard Erickson, again, writing on this particular text, says to suggest that foreknowledge here means nothing more than previous knowledge or acquaintance is to virtually deprive these verses of any real meaning. Foreknowledge carries with it the idea of a favorable disposition or selection as well as advanced knowledge. There's an interesting verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3 where Paul writes this to the church at Corinth. He says, if anyone loves God, he has been known by God. Been known by God. So what is the grounds by which you love him? So if you read that verse, if anyone loves God, Paul says to the church, he has been known by God. Reading again John 10 this morning, the sheep hear his voice. If you follow that logic, he doesn't lose any of his sheep. John 10 is so helpful and informative on this. And so we have the idea of foreknowledge, which I would suggest to you goes beyond just his omniscience to his actually 
his actually calling and working these things out. And then we have the term predestination. Let's move pretty quickly here. The next term is predestined. Simple is that it could be or rightly explained as chosen beforehand. That's a simple thing. Now, here's where it gets very shocking. And this, again, is a debate, but let me walk through it because I hope this does generate conversation. And I do know that some, again, have, this is, that this has gone to gnashing of teeth or confusion. I get it. But let me just, pre, got chosen beforehand. Notice what he says, that God has predestined, right? He, he, those whom he has predestined. So again, God is the, the subject. The aorist verb is predestined. God has chosen, works this out, the same idea of the term election. But I would suggest in this one, it opens up a category of that he's in salvation. We see the term election positively to Christ saved. And even in damnation, the concept of reprobation. This is where you could consider it this way. God chooses positively for someone to be saved. It also must be true that he chooses negatively for someone to be damned. Now, this is what is expressed in chapter 9, and we'll have to save that for later. But let me say here, when you think about this idea of what's happening, we actually see the glory of God in choosing to save anyone. So before we get bogged down in the negative side of this or the positive side of this, let me remind you that no one... Because the debate of human free choice comes up quickly on this. And it is a difficult one. But what I think gets lost in that is that we have to remember that no one deserves his grace. And I think that that should be helpful. Like A lot of the arguments on both sides, actually, can forget that no one deserves his grace. And again, that's hard for us. This is very difficult. By the way, this doesn't make, this, this position or my position doesn't make Paul a fatalist. Before we, I came up here, just a little side note. You want to know what I was praying? Because I knew this was going to probably generate some conversation. Who knows how it might respond. Here's what I was praying. Uh, let me find it. Second Corinthians, you can just listen. I'll get there. This is what I was praying this position of predestination did not make Paul a fatalist, and it shouldn't make you or me. Paul says at the end of 2 Corinthians 5, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Did you hear what he said? We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I don't think Paul's theology in the idea of predestination or election led him to being cold and calloused. No, I think you find an urgency in Paul that Paul didn't know who would be saved. But he was definitely a very passionate evangelist. So I was praying that before I came up because I knew this was going to be difficult, right? But here's the thing when you think about predestination. So when you put predestination and divine foreknowledge together, here's a simple thing to consider. They do not equal man's self-determination as the grounds of his salvation but rather God's sovereign will and act. Here's my definition of predestination. Predestination is God's sovereign work toward the direction of his intended aim or sovereign will. It's his work towards his will. I urge you, so in this, as emotions begin to flare, I urge you to consider or keep in mind both the gracious side of God in saving anyone and the just side of God in condemning anyone. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 10, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Do you see the gravity of this? I think it should cause great humility, not great division. God is at work. Fornu, predestined, he called. We've already dealt with this, so more, a little bit quicker here. The next part of the chain is those whom he predestined, those whom he called. You see, the call here, if you think through it carefully, is actually a call that works. Now, I do believe the Bible teaches that there is a general call, right? That we are to be sharing the gospel, right? 
Even Spurgeon would say about the division between human sovereignty and divine election, Spurgeon, to put it in Spurgeon language, he's like, we don't know who the elect are. God did not point, paint a yellow stripe up their back. So we share the gospel indiscriminately. We don't go around pulling people's shirts up to see who has the yellow stripe. I think that's helpful. But here, this call, let me just say it. This call in Paul's theology here, it works. It works. It's a treasuring. It is, it is a divine call. And here I would suggest to you, there are no potential salvations or dropouts. It is a fixed and certain call. It is a summons that powerfully works to raise the dead. It works. And what this is showing us is that the call of God works to secure us. It, we see this. And then the next term, justified. Right? Notice... Not only do we see that this chain reaction, those whom he calls, he also justifies them. Simply here is that we are declared righteous, not on our merit. We are declared righteous based upon his sovereign act by faith. We are declared righteous, right? In our salvation, we receive a judicial standing that we don't deserve. Here, the guilty are being credited with a righteousness that's not their own. And then the last term is that then we're glorified. Notice. So we see foreknowledge. We see predestination. We see calling. And then we see justification. And then notice what some call the grandest, most uh, beautiful part of this chain. And it, notice what he says. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, m- some of my English folks in the room. Glorification, the doctrine of glorification is when. When's it supposed to be? Later. Now think about this for just a moment. The doctrine of glorification is the new heavens, new earth, the resurrected body, everything that we're waiting for. But do you notice anything wrong with the English? It's 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 mind boggling that Paul writes, it's in the aorist, it's it's actually sort of past that's still working. Is Paul would have, okay, Paul would have failed the English test here is what I'm trying to say. But here's what's so powerful about this is that this sovereign salvation works so powerfully that it actually accomplishes everything into eternity. That Paul is not confused here. Paul is resting his case that even in the midst of suffering, this salvation works to keep us. It works to keep us. So in the mind of Paul... What God does here is a sure thing that carries us into the future. This is why this whole thing doesn't have to create doubt. It actually should create comfort when you encounter difficulty. That in the mind of Paul, he and we as Christians are already glorified, but yet we're waiting. Who thinks that way? Only Paul. And so a lot here, but let me just give you some takeaways because I know it raises a lot of questions. Okay, let me give you six quickly. Number one, we must see this link in verses 29 and 30, specifically 30, as an inseparable link in our salvation, that it's linked together. One of the most helpful statements on this I found in an old commentary set, so helpful. This is the Renaissance Commentary series. It says, this link is undeniable and must be held together. That is, glorification is contingent upon justification which is contingent upon calling, and all three of these are contingent upon God's timeless decree to have it so. This is the mind and work of God. So this link is inseparable. Number two, quickly, this is a, what Paul is dealing with here is a certain salvation, not a possible or hypothetical salvation described in this text. And here's the thing. It is not talking about who might be saved. It's actually describing who is saved. And that should be helpful. Number three, this text and many others shuts the door on what's called popularly today open theism. And some of you have been infected by this. Open theism is the idea that the future is open and that God is learning along the way. And he's responding to what his creatures in the world would do. No, from God's standpoint, the future is fixed. God is active in unfolding his plans in the world and in our lives. 
Your view of God matters here. So open theism, and there's a lot of other things here, but that's one that I would suggest that you consider. Number four, God's sovereignty and salvation does not, please hear me, nor should it promote pride, but deep humility. Deep humility. When you think about this chain and order of salvation. To fight and argue and become divisive is not a help. A good friend of mine told me on this conversation years ago. He said, Jamie, your theology should humble you. It shouldn't make you arrogant. And so I'm, I'm trying to live by that. As a matter of fact, if you believe in God's sovereignty... I, why would we want to fight? Food for thought. Number five. It is true, here it is, that this does create a supposed tension between, right, human responsibility and divine sovereignty. I get it. I do. When you hear that your salvation was something God planned, God accomplished, and God applied, it raises the question about my choice, right? And what does it exactly mean to be free or as some have coined, what's free will, right? So I get it. So if God decrees who will be saved and who will not be saved, then are we true free, freely creatures? This is, the, this is the debate, isn't it? And there are two major views. You've got the Augustinian, Reformed, Calvinist side. You've got the Whitfield side, George Whitfield. You've got the Arminian, Pelagian view, semi-Pelagian. You've got the Wesley side, right? There's differences here. But let me just say, even as these are difficult conversations, that these are apparent contradictions, right? Man's responsibility and divine sovereignty, but they're not real contradictions. In other words, it is super complex. Let's just grant it. When you, some of you may be brand new believers and you're thinking, what in the world? But these are important things to consider. And I think admittedly we must admit that wherever you lean on this, please hear me, I would suggest that, that it's actually a profitable difference. It doesn't have to be a divisive difference. Um, I need people who disagree with me to challenge me. And I think churches that sort of just want to form one quick conversation, one quick camp... I don't think that's necessarily healthy, just food for thought. I actually think in God's sovereignty, the, the debate is actually put there because we're fallen. Um, I don't have it all worked out. I will agree with you that this is the, the, the whole idea here is a difficult one. In other words, it is super complex to reconcile this. It is hard. But I think that the hard work here is reasonable and that there are explanations. I would also suggest, as many have, is that there... Even though there may seem to be contradictions, they're not. They're actually mysteries. And I think that this is, it was helpful for me this week, just didn't know when this was coming. It's like, okay, there, the Bible isn't contradicting itself. It is complex, but there aren't contradictions here. There are divine mysteries. And all of us in our dogmatism need to remember that. We need to remember that. And I think that can help us. A major takeaway, though, here's the last one. A major takeaway from these two verses, verses 29 and 30, and I think this is important because we get back to Paul's argument. Why is it here? Instead of the debate. Why is it here? I suggest that it's here for our security and assurance. I think the major takeaway from these two verses in context is the believer's security. The truth of God's sovereignty and salvation is the foundation of our assurance, not a denomination or one book that's been written, but that God saves us. And when you encounter difficulty, you, we need to know underneath our feet what holds us fast. What holds us fast? I'm not strong enough on my own. You see, the reason that our confidence is not dashed upon the rocks of sorrow is because God's salvation is sure and fixed. God saves perfectly and eternally, and we can move forward with confidence. We don't have to doubt his power to save us and take us all the way home. So here's a couple points of application. When you fear, you don't have to. When sorrows come your way, trust the one who has saved you. 
When doubt comes, remember the work of Jesus and the change that he has wrought in your life. Trust the one who has saved you. So don't be paralyzed by cultural shifts or pressures. Steady on towards your forever home and trust the one who has saved you. The end of Jude, let me just share with you, again reading this morning, the end of Jude. Turn there, I think it would be helpful as we come this to a conclusion this morning. This little letter, powerful doxology at the end. Because I know that some of you are enduring difficulty and you're not really interested in the debate, <laughs> right? You're like, can you just tell me something that I, I'm really not interested in that point number four and five. But can you actually tell me something that would help me? Because my marriage is falling apart. My kids are wayward. I'm struggling. Can you tell me something that the Bible actually says to help me? Jude does. Look at verse 24 and 25. Now to him, see this, who is able to keep you from stumbling. Who's the keeping attributed to? When you feel right now that your faith, you're like, where is it? I couldn't sing this morning. I'm angry right now. I don't know how this is going to work out tomorrow. Where Where are you resting? Now to him who is able to keep you, dear friend. from stumbling and present you blameless. How in the world? Do you feel that? I know at times I don't. To present you blameless before the presence of his glory. Now notice, with great joy. And then notice the end of this doxology. To the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be glory and majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So before you run to worldly counselors, before we take up the rigorous debate that has yet to be solved, When suffering comes our way, we remember that God is sovereign in our salvation. God does this. And it is attributed not to my determination and my power and my ability. And my strength and my education and my, the list goes on and on and on, but no. God in his grace, God in his grace does this. Father, thank you for hard things. Lord, I admit either side of these debates or struggles can lead any of us to pride. And it can can have a ruinous effect in what you want to do. And so, Lord, we just come this morning thankful for grace, thankful for the debate, actually. But we pray that there would be humility. Lord, we just, we throw ourselves on your mercy. How unsearchable are your ways, O Lord, how inscrutable are your ways in all the world. And we are just recipients of this. And so, God, I pray that the end result would be a stronger faith. But, Lord, that we would think deeply about your word in your ways. And God, I pray this morning that for all of us, for myself included, that it would not be a cliche that we simply say that none of us are deserving of grace, but we would really feel that in our bones, 
God, that you would help us to know that we deserve justice. We deserve wrath. Our sin deserves punishment. But yet, because of Jesus, we get grace. And so we celebrate that. We celebrate that together this morning.